let you know that before I came here, I was in a conference in Des Moines, Iowa, with 1,700 people from our churches in the Midwest of the United States. It was a very lively and fun conference. And the first thing we did was spend an hour praying together, all 1,700 people. And one of the things we prayed for was for your churches and for this conference. And I found out that I, I left early to fly here, and I found out that after I left, they all prayed again for the conference. So we have lots of prayers stored up for this conference. I would like to tell you a joke, if that's okay with you. Earlier, Daniel gave me some peanuts, and it reminded me of a joke. A man was volunteering at a nursing home. He was sitting with an elderly woman, very old. She was, her face was shriveled. And as he talked with her, he saw a bowl of peanuts on the table. He began to eat the peanuts. By the end of the conversation, all of the peanuts were gone. He felt terrible. He said, ma'am, I'm sorry. I ate all of your peanuts. And she said to him, that's okay, dear. I've already sucked the chocolate off of all of them. <laughs> So that's what I thought of while I ate Daniel's peanuts. <laughs> what would you do if you were walking down the street and Cristiano Ronaldo walked up to you and said, come follow me? It would be a shocking experience. But of course, you would follow him with eagerness and expectation, wondering what's going to happen next. Maybe for the women, it might be different. <laughs> but imagine someone who you look up to. Ronaldo is not here in this room. And he does not care about you or me. But there is someone far greater than Cristiano Ronaldo who is in this room. And he says to you, come follow me. The Lord of the universe, the King of kings. And he says to you, Come, follow me. Tonight we will talk about the call of Christ. As we seek to hear God's voice, one way we can seek Him is to walk in the Scriptures with the saints who heard God's voice. Tonight we will do that with Peter. We start in John chapter 1. John chapter 1, verse 35. The next day, again, John was standing with two of his disciples. And he looked at Jesus as he walked by and said, Behold, the Lamb of God. The two disciples heard him say this, and they followed Jesus. Jesus turned and saw them following and said to them, What are you seeking? And they said to him, Rabbi, which means teacher, where are you staying? He said to them, Come and you will see. So they came and saw where he was staying. And they stayed with him that day, for it was about the tenth hour. 
One of the two who had heard John speak and followed Jesus was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. He first found his own brother Simon and said to him, We have found the Messiah, which means Christ. He brought him to Jesus. Jesus looked at him and said, You are Simon, the son of John. You shall be called Cephas, which means Peter or rock. Now to, to hear God's voice with Peter, you have to be in his shoes. You are a young person. You are just getting started in your career. Maybe you're at work and your brother comes to you and says, we have found the Messiah. And you say, okay. You don't know what's happening next. So you walk with your brother and you find this man you do not know. And he looks at you and says your name. And then he gives you a new name. That's a strange experience. It's like meeting Jesus. And, and before we can meet, I say, you are Jesus. De ahora, te llamarás Montaña. <laughs> you are Jesus. From now on, you will be called Mountain. That would be strange. That's a, that's a strange greeting. What do you think that was like for Peter? Peter did not understand what was happening to him. He did not realize that he had come face to face with the Lord Jesus Christ, the King of Kings and the Creator of the universe. He did not realize that he had just been given a brand new identity by the King of Kings. We live our lives and we think about God. Maybe we grow up in church. We think about the idea of God. And then one day we realize that God is also thinking about us. You realize that God sees you and He knows you and He has plans for you. And to come to know Jesus in this way is to have everything changed. It's to have a new life and a new identity in your new name in Christ. We continue on in Luke chapter 5. Luke chapter 5, verse 1. On one occasion, while the crowd was pressing in on him to hear the word of God, Jesus, he was standing by the lake of Gennesaret, and he saw two boats by the lake, but the fishermen had gone out of them and were washing their nets. Getting into one of the boats, which was Simon's, Peter's, he asked him to put out a little from the land, and he sat down and taught the people from the boat. And when he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, put out into the deep, and let down your nets for a catch. And Simon answered, Master, we toiled all night and took nothing, but at your word I will let down the nets. He doesn't quite understand who he is dealing with. With his tongue in cheek, as we say, um, disbelieving, he says, we're fishermen, Jesus. We know what we're doing, but since you say so. And when they had done this, verse 6, they enclosed a large number of fish, and their nets were breaking. 
they signaled to their partners in the other boat to come and help them. And they came and filled both the boats so that they began to sink. But when Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees, saying, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. For he and all who were with him were astonished at the catch of fish that they had taken. And so also were James and John, sons of Zebedee, who were partners with Simon. And Jesus said to Simon, Do not be afraid. From now on you will be catching men. And when they had brought their boats to land, they left everything and followed him. Peter thought he had something to teach Jesus about fish. Now he realizes that he is the student. He realizes that he had treated with dishonor someone of much greater worth than himself. And they left everything and followed him. As you get to know Jesus, you begin to experience his power and his greatness. You come to find that nothing else means as much to you. Many of us have come to the decision that whatever else happens from now on, before everything else, I am a follower of Christ. I am an engineer, I am a pharmacist, I am Romanian, I am for Barcelona, but I am a follower of Christ first. Are you following Christ? Or are you following someone else who is following Christ? What if your pastor was no longer here? What if your parents were no longer here? What if the people around you, your peers, your friends were no longer here? Would you follow Christ? My friends, Christ knows your name. Christ sees you and has plans for your life. And his voice calls to you, come and follow me. Do you hear it? I want to say something to the young people in the room. There is a tremendous need in this world for young people to hear the message of Jesus. In Europe, the vast majority of young men and women do not know Christ. They think they know who Christ is and they have no idea. They are living in darkness. And on the outside, they may seem like they are fine. They may seem happy. They may seem like they have things together. But I know from experience that on the inside, their hearts are crying out for more. Their hearts are crying out for more meaning. Their hearts are crying out in loneliness. They are suffering from pain and suffering in life. And Christ can save them. But who will tell them? I owe my life to the young men and women who live in my dormitory in college. They followed Christ. 
they themselves followed Christ. And they were willing to be bold and tell me about Christ. And though I looked on the outside like everything was together, on the inside I was desperate for them to help me. Will you follow Christ for them? There is a story about St. Paul's Cathedral in London. At one time, it was planned to be the greatest cathedral on earth. It was designed by a man named Sir Christopher Wren. And a reporter went to the site to see it become built. And he interviewed some workers. He found one man and said, what are you doing here? The man said, I'm putting a rock in a hole. He found another man, and he said, what are you doing here? And this man stopped, and he smiled, and he said, I am helping Sir Christopher Wren build the greatest cathedral on earth. Now, which do you think was having a better time? How about you? What are you doing here? Are you going to meetings? Are you playing an instrument? Or are you helping the Lord Jesus Christ build the kingdom of God on earth? What a privilege. Christ is restoring humanity. Building the eternal kingdom of God. And I can help. Christ calls you. Are you following Him? The greatest adventure is to be found in following Christ. I came from a small town. I came from a long line of small town people. They did not travel. They did not have interesting experiences. And yet because of Christ, I have seen the world. I have traveled all across my country. I have met amazing men and women from all over the world. And I have friends around the world who I have helped enter and build the kingdom of God. Me. I'm nothing. And yet, I can follow Christ and live the great adventure with Peter. Peter went on to become one of the most prominent disciples. He was bold. He was faithful. He was ready for action. And that's why what happens next is so surprising. Turn with me to Luke chapter 22. Chapter 22, verse 31. This is the Last Supper. Jesus is speaking. Simon, Simon, behold, Satan demanded to have you, that he might sift you like wheat. But I have prayed for you that your faith may not fail. And when you have turned again, strengthen your brothers. Peter said to him, Lord, 
I'm ready to go with you to prison and to death. Jesus said, I tell you, Peter, the rooster will not crow this day until you deny three times that you know me. Can you imagine what this felt like for Peter? He would give anything for Jesus. He would die for Jesus. And Jesus tells him, you're going to fail me. Imagine the heartache. No, Jesus. Never. And turn to verse 54. Then they seized him, Jesus, and led him away, bringing him into the high priest's house. And Peter was following at a distance. And when they had kindled a fire in the middle of the courtyard and sat down together, Peter sat down among them. Then a servant girl, seeing him as he sat in the light and looking closely at him, said, This man also was with him. But he denied it, saying, Woman, I do not know him. And a little later, someone else saw him and said, you also are one of them. But Peter said, man, I am not. And after an interval of about an hour, still another insisted, saying, certainly this man also was with him, for he too is a Galilean. But Peter said, man, I do not know what you are talking about. And immediately, while he was still speaking, the rooster crowed. And the Lord turned and looked at Peter. Imagine the experience for Peter. He denies his Lord. And then he is forced to turn and look his Lord in the eyes. And Peter remembered the saying of the Lord and how he had said to him, before the rooster crows today, you will deny me three times. And he went out and wept bitterly. I can't imagine a worse, a worse experience. Peter had his heart ripped open and came face to face with his cowardice, his self-preservation, and he saw what he was. And in his shame, he turned to see Jesus, the one person who he cared about, looking straight into that shame. Satan wanted to test Peter. Satan comes in again with that question, does anyone really love God? And he says, Peter does not love you, Jesus. And he tests him. He sifts him. And Peter fails. Do you think that if you are following Christ, that Satan does not want to sift you like me? The same question is asked of your life. Does she really love Jesus? What's interesting about Peter is that he is tested in his greatest strength. His strength is courageous commitment to Christ. And that's what fails. He has this one thing to bring to the table. And he fails. If you are following Christ, you may be tested 
and you may be tested in your area of strength. What will happen then? How did Peter respond? Let's go to John chapter 21. You and I know the good news. Christ was raised from the grave. And the disciples learned the good news. That Christ is alive. And we find Peter in verse 2. Simon Peter, Thomas called the twin, Nathaniel of Cana in Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and two others of his disciples were together. Simon Peter said to them, I am going fishing. They said to him, we will go with you. And they went out and got into the boat, but that night they caught nothing. He went fishing. Because that's what he knew. Christ is alive. But what does he want with me? Could someone bring me a bottle of water, please? I'm thirsty and we need to wait for that sound to be sorted out. Okay, it's done. Yes. Okay. <laughs> Peter goes fishing. Because what would Christ want with Peter now? If Peter thought he was going to do great things for Christ. So he left his life behind. But now he sees he was wrong. I'm nothing, he says. I'm a coward. And so he goes back to his old life. I'm going fishing. But Jesus isn't done, is he? Verse 4. Just as day was breaking, Jesus stood on the shore, yet the disciples did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to them, Children, do you have any fish? They answered him, No. He said to them, Cast the net on the right side of the boat, and you will find some. So they cast it, and now they were not able to haul it in because of the quantity of fish. That disciple whom Jesus loved therefore said to Peter, It is the Lord. When Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he put on his outer garment, for he was stripped for work, and he threw himself into the sea. The other disciples came in the boat, dragging the net full of fish, for they were not far from the land, but about a hundred yards off. It's a very moving scene. He distanced himself from Jesus. What does Jesus want with me? And yet when he sees him, He's filled with love and he dives into the water. When they go out on land, they saw a charcoal fire in a place with fish laid out on it and bread. Jesus said to them, bring some of the fish that you have just caught. So Simon Peter went aboard and hauled the net ashore full of large fish. Then in verse 15, when they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? We don't know what that means. Do you love me more than these fish? Do you love me more than you love other things? Or is he saying, do you love me more than the other disciples love me? We don't know. But despite everything, Peter loves his Lord. He says, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. 
And he said to him, feed my lambs. He said to him a second time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And he said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, tend my sheep. He said to him the third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was grieved because he said to him the third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. And Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. When Jesus first called Peter, it was in a boat with a miraculous display of Christ's power. Christ knew all along what was coming next. But Peter did it. Peter had to learn something. He had to learn what he was before he could become the rock. He had to learn that he wasn't the rock, but Christ was the rock. And he was restored. Jesus had looked into the heart of his soul and he saw failure and weakness and shame. He saw the absolute worst and he loved him and he embraced him. And from there, Peter went on to Acts chapter 2 where he preaches the great sermon and 3,000 souls are saved. And in Acts 3, he heals a beggar and preaches a sermon and 2,000 souls are saved. And in Acts chapter 4, he's dragged before the Sanhedrin, the authorities, and they threaten his life and he laughs in their faces. He says, what can you do to me? You tell me, is it right to obey God or you? And he goes right back to the streets, preaching Christ. What changed? How did Simon, the coward, become Peter, the Apostle. Peter saw the absolute worst in himself. He knew that Jesus saw the absolute worst in him. And not only did Jesus still love him, Not only had Jesus not given up on him, Jesus knew the entire time it was going to happen. Think about that. Jesus knew the first day he called Peter that this was coming. When you go through this kind of experience, You see what you are, and you see that God still loves you. And you realize that God can never be disappointed with you, because He saw it all from the beginning. You find tremendous power. You are released from your fears. You can change the world. In John 15, 16, let's read that together. Turn in your Bibles to John 15, verse 16. I want you to hear 
the voice of the Lord with me. You did not choose me, but I chose you. You, Henry, did not choose me, but I chose you. You, Lydia, did not choose me, but I chose you. What incredible words. And when he chose you, he knew from the beginning all of your failures and all of your weaknesses. And he chose you anyway. And you might have to realize what you are. You might have to be taken to the end of yourself. But know that Christ has already seen it. And he has embraced you. You will be sifted when you follow Christ. You will find moments of failure. You will find moments of weakness. And the more you follow Christ, the more sinful you will see yourself to be. But do not despair. Because sin and weakness and failure do not disqualify you from the love of God or service to Christ. And often it's that very weakness and failure that will make you the great hero of faith that God made you to be. Why did Jesus allow Peter to be sifted? Because Peter needed to see what he was. Because we needed Peter to see what he was. Because Jesus wants fearless saints. But it's more than that. Jesus wants your heart. Peter, do you love me? That's what Jesus wanted. He didn't want Peter for what Peter could do. He wanted Peter because Peter was his. Let's show the picture of my daughter Elizabeth again. Do we have access to that? My daughter is seven and she still does not speak. She still wears diapers. She breaks all of my things. She threw my iPad in the washing machine. <laughs> and it got washed. While my friends are retiring, I will be taking care of my daughter full time. I will spend my life taking care of her. She's not going to do great things in the world's eyes. Other than you all, maybe no one will know her. But she's the greatest treasure in my life. I love her. And I want her heart. And when she stumbles and breaks my things, when she gets mad and throws something at my face, <laughs> when she fails, I don't yell at her. I don't get disappointed in her. Because I know what she is. I know who she is. And I love her. Friends, God loves you. And He wants your heart. 
Let's pray. I'm a little bit tired. <laughs> it's the jet lag. God, we thank you for your love. We thank you that this is a universe filled with love. We thank you that you see us. You see all of our sin. You see all of your weakness. It's nothing new to you. And you love us. Lord, we give you our hearts tonight. You endured the cross. You endured the agony of hell because you wanted our hearts. And tonight we give you what you suffered for. God, I pray for the young men and women in this room. Pray that they would hear your voice. I pray that they would rise up and they would give you their hearts and follow you their whole life. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 We are going to take time now and give you a few moments to spend with God. So for the next 20 minutes, we want to invite you to take your Bible or to, to get out and pray and reflect on what is in your heart and go and give your Lord your heart. So you could go for a walk, you can find a quiet place, you can go to your room, about 20 minutes. And then come back here, and we have a few more minutes together after that. Does that sound good? Okay, let's go.